Right, hey guys, and welcome back to the Road of Yorkshire, and welcome back here in the Krull Room. Unfortunately, there is no race for me to shout about just yet in this lovely, lovely cupboard. But, rest assured, Formula One will be back very, very soon from its summer break, and uh, I can't wait to get stuck into the races once they happen. But, for now, we are ranking the 20 drivers of Formula One. If you didn't catch out my ranking rating on Tuesday's episode, which was ranking 20th to 11th, then I suggest you go watch that one first, then pop back, pop back here, because this time it is my ranking of 10th, to first. This one's the hot spicy one, I feel. There's uh, some drivers on here that you'll maybe think, yeah, they deserve to be inside the top 10, but I wouldn't have put them that low or I wouldn't have put them that high. There's, uh, there's some topics to talk about for sure. That being said though, I am very much looking forward to getting my teeth stuck into this one. And uh, yeah, join me for the ride. Join me for the ride. This one's going to be a hot spicy one, I feel. So uh, strap in. In 10th place on this list is Oscar Pastry. Now, is that one already, is already people gasping at your telly or your phone or your laptop? Are they already gasping? Like, you can't put him there. Josh has had a fantastic season so far. Well, he's 10th in my eyes. Um, yeah, unfortunately for Oscar Piastri, he's had his first ever maiden win. Congratulations to him. He's had a couple of podiums as well, of course. Let's not forget that. But... And there is a big but. McLaren should have done more this year. The drivers should have done more this year. And they've left a lot on the table. They have left a lot on the table. Admittedly, you know, Oscar's had the likes of Silverstone where he was screwed over by strategy by him not double stacking when it was time for the slick tyres. I get that. I get that. But he has been the bridesmaid towards Lando Norris. And do I really rate Lando this season? Ah! You'll have to find out in a minute. But Oscar Piastri for me is a great rookie, is a great guy. There, there is a massive potential within him. He's not here 10th because I don't think he deserves to be here. Obviously, if I didn't think he deserved to be here, it would be in my last episode. You know, he deserves a spot inside the top 10. But then when you look at the other drivers this season and you look at 10th, you think, well, there's only one guy that can fill it. And that is Oscar Piastri. He's had some great performances. He's had some good drives. But they've not matched the pace of that McLaren on enough occasions for me. That's how I would word it. You know, the, the car has been there. At worst, I think it was third best at the start of the season. But as the season has progressed, it's been second or first best easily throughout most of it. So after, well, Miami basically, Miami onwards, that car has been first or second best. You can arguably say whichever for each race afterwards. But it has been, and Oscar hasn't always been there when it mattered. So yeah, Oscar Piastri for me is in 10th place. It's no disrespect or discredit to him. I just think there's more in that McLaren car than that driver has got out of it personally. But he's certainly a great asset to McLaren. And if he can continue how he's been in the likes of Hungary into the remaining 10 races... He's going to have a fantastically strong finish to the season and he will finish well high up in the crawl room standings. And if I did this again at the end of the season, it could be inside the top five. So yeah, no disrespect to Oscar Piastri for being here. It's just that the McLaren has been a frustrating team this season and it's more often than not being the drivers leaving a little bit left on the table when they could have had a podium, could have had a victory. It's just not come together. So yeah, Oscar Piastri is 10th on this list. In ninth place, we come to Lewis Hamilton. Oh, God, if there weren't any gasps for Oscar, there's, also, there's certainly gasps now for Lewis. The first half of this season, I am sorry he was poor. And you, you cannot take away from that. You know, it's been great to see him win a couple of races. Silverstone onwards, he has just been rejuvenated. He has done so well. He really, really has. These last few races going into this summer break, he's delivered really, really well. But those three races don't make up for the previous 11 where there's not been much to talk about. Let's be honest, you know... That's where I am in my eyes anyway. I know people are going to heavily disagree with this, but Lewis Hamilton for me, ninth place, is the best I can give him. Had it not been for these victories towards the end and this podium, it'd be in the bottom half because he's just not really delivered. 
like I said, the last three races have been fantastic for him. He's certainly found his mojo back. But the, the but the early eleven races, there's maybe been one or two good performances in there somewhere middled around. Uh, but for the most part, he's been beaten by George, outraced by George, outqualified by George. Like I said, it's just these last half of the, these last three races that he's got it together. Before then, forget about it. He really didn't deliver anything at all that was really spectacular or special. So, yeah, and and again, it's no hate on Hamilton. It's just assessing a season as a whole, you know. And you just look at it and you go on paper and you just think, well, it's just not gone. There's a big chunk there where it's not gone well. And again, I know Mercedes have had the upgrades and I know they've got better towards the latter half of this first half of the season because of the upgrades and things. But... There's been races there where he's been very lonely, struggling to pick up points, you know, getting it knocked out in Q1, Q2. That first half of the season, that car certainly deserved to be long inside the top 10 regularly, possibly inside the top five, and he took him forever before he even got a top five finish, wasn't it? I think his best finish was eighth for a long time at the start of the season. So, yeah, the first half of the season really does mean that he's low down here. But if he can continue in these last three races like he will do into the next ten, if, he, if, he, if the next ten races are like these last three that he's done, he's easily going to be inside the top five come the end of the season, without a shadow of a doubt. And he is really going to be doing well, and everyone's going to be saying, yeah, he's maybe regretting leaving for Ferrari at that point then. Whereas at the moment, at the first half of the season, you're thinking, are Ferrari regretting signing him because he's not doing much good? So yeah, Lewis Hamilton, fantastic to see him win a couple more races. He has been really great these last couple of races, but unfortunately, the first half of the season has been 14 races long, and he's been very anonymous for the most of them. So there you go. Lewis Hamilton is ninth on this list. In eighth place, we come to George, George, George of the Russell. Yes, here he is in P8. Again, a bit like Hamilton. I think the Mercedes duo have left more on the table in the first half of the first half of the season, if that makes sense. The first seven or eight races where they were realistically nowhere. George admittedly was beating Lewis, and I totally get that in that first section of the season. But then Hamilton started to catch up, then Hamilton was beating him, and it's just been a scruffy season overall for George. You know, you've, I mean, well, I mean, look at Australia, for example. Stupid, stupid error, big accident big contact big damage on the last lap there rolled the car into the middle of the track and again it's like incidents like that where you just think oh fucking hell George you know there's there's more in you than that and you know he was very unlucky to lose and be disqualified from the victory at Spa which was rightfully his unfortunately the car was underweight rules are rules had to be disqualified but that was a great drive by George and again if he can deliver that into the next half great Brilliant, perfect, but this first half of the season for George, I would say, has been more consistent than what Lewis Hamilton has delivered, but it's been more erratic, it's been more on and off like a switch, whereas Hamilton's been like, no pace, no pace, no pace, 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 and gone like that, George has been like that all season, like a yo-yo, and you just really couldn't work out where he was going to be one weekend to the next, so yeah, George Russell for me, eighth in the standings, again, not really any disrespect to him, of course, but... It could have been more. It could have been more. Yeah, you know, he won the racing spot. We know that. But for the most part, it has been one of those... Still what could have been. He could have been a lot closer to the other cars around him in the championship. Uh, Mercedes could have had a few more points under the belt. But that's life, isn't it? So, yeah, George, eighth on this list. Seventh place. We come to... Lando. Lando Norris. In the second of the McLarens, people are going to be saying, oh no, he deserves to be inside the top three. Look at him, he's challenging Max Verstappen for the championship. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. And this is the point. This is the point. You look at McLaren's season this season, they could have maybe had seven wins if they got it all together. Instead, they've got two. They've left five on the table there. Admittedly, some of them have been strategic errors. Totally agree with that. Canada, for example, strategic error. Silverstone, strategic error. That's two. There's still three there. Austria should have happened. Should have been a win. He fell over Max Verstappen. They they fell out with each other. He got stupid. But even if he'd have overtaken Max cleanly, he still got that five second time penalty for just driving wherever he wanted. Lost his head. That should have been a victory. And we, we've seen uh, the lack of pace in races as well, where he starts off strongly, or like Imola, where he's poor pace, then strong, then it's too late to mount an attack. 
there's five wins there that have gone begging for McLaren this year, and that's ridiculous, really, to say. But it is true. Already, two we can put down to team errors, three we put down to driver errors, and those three occasion, or just lack of pace by drivers, those three are down to Lando Norris. Uh, Miami was a prime example. Poor qualifying efforts, uh, and then having to recover the situation every time. Recover, recover, recover. Uh, it's it's not about that. You need to be up there and then stay up there, not recover through and then praise you because you finished third. No, it needs to be like the likes of you qualify third, you win. Not qualify eighth and finish third. That's not how it works. So, yeah, poor qualifying performances. I've missed Miami. Miami, I can't remember what I got Miami we mixed up with. Was that the spring qualifying, wasn't it? Yeah, the spring qualifying, he had a poor qualifying, then got involved in the tangle, didn't he? Uh, but, yeah, we've seen, like, poor qualifying errors by him, missing lap times and, you know, tra track limit deletions and stuff. And, just not getting it together when it matters, and then he's on the back foot for the race. Recovers to a podium, everyone cheers, but he shouldn't have been down that low to start with. So that's where uh, the frustration with Lando comes from with me, and that is purely it. It is frustration. He's had a great season. You know, he's second in the standings. That's the best he's ever done. But he could be a hell of a lot closer to Max. He's left a lot of points on the table. And just to show really how many points he has lost, Spa was the prime example, wasn't it? Max Verstappen, a 10-place grid penalty, and yet Lando Norris still ended up crossing the line one position behind Max Verstappen. And Max hardly had that great a pace. It just kind of proves it, doesn't it? A race weekend where you think, I can get a good 10 points over him here, ends up losing out by two. It's not the way it should go. So, yeah, Lando Norris, a frustrating seventh by me. Um... Yeah, it's just been one of them seasons by him so far and unfortunately I can't see it getting any better at the moment. He needs to stop being as self-critical with himself and just needs to get his act together. That's simple as that. So yeah, seventh place for Lando Norris. Sixth place, we come to Fernando Alonso in the second of the Aston Martins. He loses a place inside the top five, unfortunately, due to these last few races where he's seemingly lost his head with the team, he's lost his head with the car... He's moaning, you know, like the, the team feedback's not been great over the radio. The, the Hungary practice session, for example, was like, oh, yeah, could you give feedback to the other car, please? How's it handling? Oh, yeah, good luck. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not what you need. It's not what you need within a team. I understand Alonso's frustrations, of course. Look where they were this time last year, Mr. Uh, Aston Martin. A run of podiums, looking like they were going to win a race at some point that season. And then this season it looks like, yeah, well, okay, we're just going to score points. Then they put an update on the car that doesn't work and they end up outside the points. I get it. It's frustration. But the way Alonso's going about it, it's not the right way, unfortunately. So, yeah, he loses out on a top, space in the top five basically because of his overall attitude. He is still the team leader. He's put some great performances in earlier on this season, some great qualifying performances as well to get that car inside the top five when it really didn't deserve to be. And that means that they're in a good advantageous position to secure a top six finish in races and things like that. He's delivered those really early on in the season. But then as soon as that update came where the car went backwards, obviously, understandably, Alonso went backwards with it. But he's just not been able to find his feet from there. Lost his mojo. Like he's lost confidence within the car. Lost confidence within the team. And, by, and rather than trying to be productive about trying to get him back up there, he's kind of fell on his face there and fell on his own sword and gone, well, fuck it, I don't give a shit anyway. And he's taken the Kimi Raikkonen approach of, I don't really care, to be honest. Not the right way to be. So, unfortunately for Fernando Alonso, he is sixth in the standings. It would have been a top five had it not been for his attitude. Some good performances this season. The main breadwinner of points, as always, for the Aston Martin squad. He's a great asset to that team, but he could just be a little bit more of a team player these last few races uh, to enable Aston Martin to try and challenge back up at the front again. Fifth place, we come to Yuki Tsunoda in the second of the RB Maxi Tampon Visa Cash App RB. I've fucked it all up completely. Don't forget you buy one, get one freeze. There you go anyway. But yeah, you know, Yuki Tsunoda this season just gets into the top five. I think had it not been for Alonso's attitude, um, then I think these, these drivers would have been swapped around. But yeah, Yuki this season delivered some good races early on. Really, really strong performances. Really has shown Ricardo up in the in the races where they've had equal opportunities to score points. There's been Canada. That's been the issue for me. Canada was a silly error by Yuki. And the last couple of races, he's not shown overall fantastic pace. But again, when the drivers are presented with equal cars, Yuki and Ricardo, 
Yuki's been getting the points, or has been very close to him at least anyway. Ricardo has been sort of nowhere. So Yuki Snowden this season overall has been a fantastic asset to the squad. Again, you look at the point standings, look at Ricardo compared to where Sonoda is. Sonoda's miles in front in the points. He is the main breadwinner for that Visa Cash App team. Really, really, really a, a credit to the team, to be honest. And it's a shame he's not even getting looked at for Red Bull. But, you know, they have said his attitude behind the scenes isn't brilliant, isn't sparkling. And we saw that over the team radio, didn't we, where he called people a fucking R. But, uh, you know, that aside, he's done well. He's had a great season. It's faltered a little bit now, but I think that's because the likes of Hass have had some good showings. Alpine sort of sneaking into the top ten every now and again. Just pushes that Visa Cash App car down a little bit more. And then when they try and do like an early stop to undercourt, or they'll do a late stop to try and get advantage if there's a safety car and things like that. It means that Sonoda drops down and he loses more places than he would. But if a well-timed safety car came out, he'd be laughing. And I think they've got to try and gamble on those when you're not looking like you're going to be scoring points on pure pace like they were at the early stages of the season. So yeah, Yuki for me has been fantastic this season. Has been a credit to the grid, a credit to the championship. I'd had him dead and buried and gone by the end of 2022. I really didn't think he deserved any more chances after that. But 2023 started delivering some good results in a car that was really poor. This season, he's come out of the blocks. He's come out fighting. He's shown Ricardo up for the most part when they've had equal cars. There's Canada. That's really been it for me. Canada's been a weak link, uh, and that's been about it, really. So, yeah, Canada for me, a bit of a weak link. Spar, he had to start from the back and then couldn't make his way through. But, again, but you know, two bad races, I would say, realistically, maybe three at a push, but over a 14-round season in a car that looks like it can just about scrape top 10 when it needs to, he's delivered those Nine times out of ten, where, where points are possible, he has delivered the goods. So well done to Yuki Snowda for that. That's why he's fifth in the standings. In fourth place, we come to Nico Ulkenberg. Yes, indeed he do. Fourth place. Just missed out on a podium, you could say, which is ironic, isn't it? I only just thought of that now. But yeah, Nico Ulkenberg, fourth in the standings. He is the main breadwinner again for Haas. What a sensational season Nico Ulkenberg has been having. He has been an absolute credit to that Haas squad. He has delivered them some stunning results, some stunning qualifyings. Some absolutely impeccable performances. And then just as I write this review and as I was looking at how to do it, he had a duff spa, didn't he? Spa weekend was very poor and he got awarded his first of the week on the Cruel Room standings. Um, so that was a shame to end his first half of the season, 14 races long, with an of the week. But the rest of the 13 races... He's really delivered what he can with that car. He has just been a fantastic asset to the grid, a fantastic asset to Haas. I can't speak more highly of him. He really has done the best he can. I think we noticed, I think he had a duff start at one of the races. Was it China or Japan? Where had he not had that duff start, he'd have probably got a point. But as it was, he ended up 11th. That's really been about it. That's as critical as I can get with it. He had one bogged down start where... He ended up finishing 11th where it could have been a 10th. But apart from that, every other time, if that car's capable of points, he's inside him, he's doing well. Q3 appearances more often than not, if not a high qualifying position in Q2, has been his main traction of this season. Gets himself in a strong position, gains places off the line, then it's down to strategy and pit stops on how he's going to form out, but he's always there fighting in and around the top 10. More often than not, it works out that he gets a point. He has had five P11s this season, though, so he has just missed out on more than one occasion. An additional five points to Al's Al tally would be a great asset, but he didn't quite work out on those occasions. But, you know, for me, Olkenberg has been one of the stories of the season. He has come out fighting. He's shown Kevin Magnussen up no end this season. And he thoroughly deserves a spot inside the top five. I don't care what anyone else says. You look back at that performance. He has been one of the best, if not the best, uh, drivers of the B category, shall we say, which is fighting for like 12th, 11th downwards, really. He's, he's been the main breadwinner for that for that absolute, you know, that, that whole group, really, that whole package of squabbling over the final points and uh, thoroughly deserving. So, yeah, Nico Walkenberg for me, P4 in the standings, hasn't really put a wheel wrong, just a shame for Spa. The last one was a little bit of a duff weekend by his standards, but, yeah, for the most part, he has been absolutely sensational. 
Third place, we come to Carlos Sainz, smooth operator, smooth, yes, very smooth indeed. Unfortunately taking a little bit of a dip though with these last few races, haven't he? Just not quite on the pace of his teammate Leclerc, it must be said, but for the first half of the season, the first half of this season, I mean he had to have his appendix out, he was the first driver to get a win, I mean Australia had incredible pace, incredible pace, even if Max Verstappen hadn't retired from that race, I think it'd have been very close to taking victory on merit himself. He was so good. The early phases of this season were absolutely fantastic. Then when Leclerc won um, Monaco, that was then the, the turning point really for, Mon for, for Leclerc's season. And then it kind of plateaued out a little bit there for Carlos. But overall, this season has been a great one by them. The pace of the car seems a little bit up and down, but for the most part, it seems like it's a fifth and sixth place car, really. Which is a shame. It is a shame to say that, but it, it is. But Carlos has been delivering those fifth and sixths as most of the times when it matters. It's just his second half of the season, he's only do delivering those fifth and sixths, whereas the first half of the season, he was getting onto the podium, he was having some great results. So yeah, Carlos, this season has been absolutely stunning by him. It's just kind of plateaued a little bit, and I just want to see a little bit of a boost, a little bit of a boost. Maybe now he's signed for Williams next season, he'll be quite happy and he won't have those contracts in the back of his head. He's, he's settled now for the next few years, so maybe he can just focus fully on driving for the second half of this season. Take some more victories, take some more podiums, take some more points for the Ferrari squad. He deserved that seat all day long. He deserved to stay there next year. It's cruel what's happened to him, but that is life of Formula 1, unfortunately. And he is going to be a great asset to the Williams team. But yeah, Carlos Sainz talking about the here and now. He's third on this list. An absolutely sensational start to the season, especially coming back after his appendix was ripped out. And uh, yeah, he's had a great start to the season. Kind of plateaued in the second half, but I think contracts... Issues behind the scenes have maybe put a part to that, so maybe into the second half of the season now. All that signed, sealed and delivered, he'll come back fighting strong, and we'll see the Carlos Sainz that we saw at the start of the season finish the season off with. Third to Carlos Sainz. Second place, we come to... Max Verstappen. Oh, no. Oh, God, I can hear the cries. I can hear the cries. Oh, no. Oh, dear, what have I done? They're coming with pitchforks for me. Oh my God, oh my days. Max Verstappen is second purely on attitude. Purely on attitude. I'm sorry to say, but it had to be. That Hungary race weekend was disgusting. The Austria team radios as well, moaning about Lando every verse end. Got annoying. Uh, you know, he's lost his head. He can't win a race now. You know, he, he's not got a car that's capable of winning every single race all the time. And Hungary was a prime example of that, and he lost his head. Absolutely lost his head. Shouting at the team, shouting at everything. And I know you're going to say, yeah, but Josh, you're basing an entire season on one uh, duff weekend. I am. But this is Max Verstappen we're talking about. You know, three times world champion, coming on to be a fourth. He's going to get this season wrapped up anyway. Why is he making life more difficult for himself? Why not just take the points that are on offer when they're available Instead of doing these stupid moves, you know, Austria, he shouldn't have come over on Lando like that. It was Lando's fault, all, most of the part, for, for when he was just driving off the track and doing everything. Totally get that, they were both to blame that weekend, but Max didn't have to veer left. And that's a shame, and Hungary just lunging up the inside of Hamilton there was just ridiculous. Uh, but... Yeah, what can you do? What can you do? So, yeah, you know, it's, it's just been a frustrating one for Max Verstappen to see him lose his head as rapidly as, as he has. And if it's going to come to a, a, a stage where you're going to look at it maybe next season, for example, and he has to have a championship fight from day dot and he's not got that massive cushion in points, what's it going to be like? You know, he's been falling out with Lando. He's been falling out with his team over just a difficult race and finishing P5. You know, he's had those arguments with his team over the fact that, yeah, I'm not going to win today, but I've still got a massive margin of points over the championship leaders. What is going to happen when he's not going to be leading the championship comfortably? If, if, I don't think it's going to happen this year, but if that starts happening next year where he's got like a seven-point gap and then the next thing you know he's only going to finish P5 and his, his, his rival's going to beat him and he's going to take the lead of the championship, what's he going to be like then? He seemed to have taken a chill pill in Spa, but seemed to have gone the other way with it. He seemed too relaxed and too chilled, and then he was like, oh, am I allowed to overtake the cars in front, please? Like, no, we'd... you need character, Max. You need character. You need to get 
you, you know, you need to be you. You need to be the fighting self on track, but you just need to keep your gob shut, and that's the main one. So, yeah, Max Verstappen, he has been fantastic this season and has delivered some good results in a car that really didn't deserve to win on occasion or didn't deserve to finish on the podium. But Austria and Hungary were really alarming for me, really concerning. We saw the old Max Verstappen that we saw of 2017, 2018, where he was getting beaten by Ricardo and he couldn't handle it and he kept smashing it into the wall and things. We don't want to see that return. So he's second on that premise. He's second on that premise that we've seen the old Max that no one really likes to see back this year. And that's been just a little bit of a concern for me. So yeah, Max Verstappen is second based on that. Without those incidents, he would be first by a mile, a clear mile. But unfortunately, attitude has to play a part. I've docked in one position. Max Verstappen, second this season. So that means the first driver, the driver in first place, it is... Sha! La la! Sacre bleu! Sha la la! And that's going to come to controversy to others as well and go, why the hell is Charles up here? He has been fantastic the second half of this season, as mentioned with Carlos already. Carlos' start, season started absolutely fantastically well, really well. Cars were teams were just sort of like one weekend they were quick, one weekend they weren't. Science was up there, getting the good results, fantastic. Then his season kind of plateaued. This season has always been about Charles Leclerc, Monaco, Bish, bash, bosh, and then all of a sudden, there he is, getting the absolute pinnacle, what he needed to do. You know, it's been great to see. And then since then, he has delivered the goods absolutely sensationally, sensationally well. There you go. He's delivered the goods really, really well, and he's just been able to deliver the results. He's there. He's always fighting. He's always there, going, 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 pushing, pushing. And you'll suddenly see at the end of a race where science has dropped away, Leclerc's still on the fringes of those Mercedes and those Red Bulls. He's just there. Those McLarens. He's just eking away. He's always in that like top five position where realistically he should maybe be seventh or eighth. He's just there in that top five, just making sure that people haven't got a pit stop window over him and things like that. They can't try something different. And he's delivering everything he's capable of getting. So, yeah, fair play to Leclerc this season. It has been incredibly, incredibly solid by him. Admittedly, at the start of the season, we were all thinking, my God, you know, science is showing him up. But as the season has plateaued out, Leclerc's continued to rise. And he has really been a great asset to that Ferrari squad once again, proving that he des does deserve to be there. And, uh, well, both drivers do, to be honest, with Ferrari. But Leclerc has really shown his worth these last few races. He's countered when it's mattered. It's not been victories as often as they'd like. It's not been podiums as often as they'd like. But he has been there at the top of his game, getting the best out of that car, the maximum out of that car, for several races. Uh, and admittedly, we know we had the likes of Silverstone and Austria where it just went wrong. You know, put them aside. And you can put them aside because they were a team error and... Uh, you know, Leclerc was just the audacious move up the inside by Perez that knocked his own wing off. It wasn't his fault in that scenario. But you can put those two incidents aside. He has been a great asset to that team. So, yeah, well done, Charles Leclerc. You are so far in my mid-season report. Number one on this list. Admittedly, you may be not the number one driver overall. You would be number two on this list. But Max Verstappen's attitude has alarmed me somewhat. And that means that look, Charles Leclerc takes the top spot. So there we have it then, guys. Those were my top 10 drivers, 10th up to 1st. Let me know down in the comments section below. Do you agree with this top 10? Would there be any drivers that were included in my other episode that you would have put here and took some out? Do you agree with Charles Leclerc being number one? Crucially, that's the main one, isn't it? Do you agree with how these top ten are positioned? Would you have moved the likes of maybe Hamilton a little bit higher, Norris a little bit higher? Would you have dropped Max further down because of his attitude? It's all interesting. I look forward to hearing it. And uh, as always, thank you so, so much for the love and continued support with the channel. So there we have it then, guys. Thank you so, so much for watching. And as always, much love.